Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. All right, I'm very excited to share a little bit with you all today. Um, as mentioned a little earlier, my name is uh, Captain Barrington Irving. Um, I guess known for a number of things, but especially back in 2007, where I set a Guinness World Record uh, to fly uh, solo around the world. Uh, very grateful to be alive and to talk about it. And I've also had a chance to do a number of cool things with young people, which uh, we'll get right into it. I was born in Kingston, Jamaica, left at the age of six, grew up in a rough neighborhood in Miami called Liberty City. At, during that time, I had nothing on my mind as it relates to math and science. I was a really good football player at the time. I played for Miami Northwestern Senior High School. We were ranked third in the nation in football. Went on to be ranked first in the nation in football two years later. I played fullback and linebacker. I was 197 pounds, 3% body fat, and had a full scholarship to attend the University of Florida. I thought football was it until one day I was in a store minding my own business, and this gentleman walked up to me, dressed in his pilot's uniform. He just got off of work, walked into the store, and said to me, hey, son, have you ever thought about becoming a pilot? The first thing I said to him was, I don't think I'm smart enough to fly an airplane. That was the first thing I told him, right? It's aviation. You see planes, they're flying. He's like, oh, I don't want to deal with that stuff. That's too much math and science. The second thing I asked him was, how much money do you make? <laughs> After he answered that question, I took an interest in aviation. <laughs> and um, interest turned into passion. And in Miami, we have this day called signing day, right? It's where all the top athletes basically decide um, which collegiate team you'll continue to play football for. And when signing day came, guess who I signed with? No one. I turned on my full scholarship to the University of Florida. And I said I wanted to become a pilot. Uh, coaches thought I had a mental breakdown. They wanted me to have psychological evaluations. Uh, all the girls in high school that used to have my jersey number painted on their faces and on their t-shirts no longer wanted to talk to me. Because I made such an unpopular decision of pursuing a STEM career. And people ask me all the time, well, what, why did you make that decision? And it didn't seem too far-fetched. I mean, I played with the number one safety in the nation, played with the number one defensive end in the nation. And I'll never forget, the closest the number one safety got to the NFL was selling hot dogs at Dolphin Stadium, right? So I saw the good and bad, especially as a top-tier athlete. So I said that I wanted to become a pilot. Um, it, was, it was very difficult, very challenging. I went to flight school. Um, it was expensive as well. I, I couldn't afford it, so I started doing odd jobs. I was even cleaning swimming pools. I didn't know how to swim, and I was cleaning pools. I was uh, working at grocery stores. I did whatever I needed to do in order to pursue my dream of becoming a pilot. Shortly after that, I said I wanted to fly around the world. Uh, definitely, it was easy to say and very challenging to execute. So what goes into all the logistics and so forth of flying around the world? Well, in order to fly around the world, um, I had to deal with being rejected over and over again. For the first two and a half years, people rejected me. This was a, a sample rejection letter. This one was from Coca-Cola. And uh, they basically said, here at the headquarters, we focus on events and programs uh, that are national or international in scope when considering sponsorship requests. But well, what do you call flying around the world? You can't get more national or international in scope than that. So I realized, rather than giving up on my dream, people weren't understanding exactly what I was trying to accomplish. Because you have to understand, in order to fly around the world, the youngest person to accomplish a feat before me was 37 years of age. I was able to do it at 23. So a lot of people didn't truly believe it could be done at such a young age. It says Oshkosh, Wisconsin, the world's largest air show, I'll go from literally booth to booth, asking people to support my flight and so forth. Made a little bit of traction, and then one day, I said, you know what, in order to fly around the world, you need a plane. This was the aircraft that I utilized to fly around the world. As you can see, it has a whole bunch of sponsors, stickers on there and so forth. This airplane cost $650,000. So how was a poor kid able to hustle an airplane that cost $650,000. I'll tell you what I did. 
No one wanted to rent me a plane, lease me one, let me borrow one. And I was so upset about that. I said, how can I outsmart the system? Right, and I'll never forget sitting on the floor in my room being frustrated. And then it hit me, the same way you look at a car and you see one logo on the front of the car, doesn't mean that company made all the parts on the car. So I researched all the parts made on this aircraft, identified who the different companies were, and I said, I'm going to go after every single manufacturer, equipment manufacturer for this plane. The first part I went after was the engine, and I'll never forget it. I drove from Miami to Mobile, Alabama, with only enough money to run a car, put gas in it, buy 12-inch sub, six inches first half of the day, six inches second half of the day, brought plenty of deodorant with me because I couldn't afford to stay in a hotel or a motel. I slept in the car. And I showed up on a Monday morning in front of this engine manufacturer in Mobile, Alabama named Continental Motors. I said, hi, my name is Barrington Irving. I'd like to see if your engine's good enough for my airplane. I had a business suit on. They totally fell for it, brought me in, gave me a tour of the place, showed me the, everything about the warranties, how the engine works, and why I should purchase their engine. I was there for a reason. And the reason why I'm, and, and the reason why I'm sharing this story is for you all to realize Opportunities are limitless. Do not limit yourself. And after taking the tour of the facility, I acted as if I knew the CEO of the company. So I said, is Brian here? And they said, which Brian? I said, Brian, who runs the company? They looked at me, and they're like, man, you really know Brian? I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I met a few times at air shows and conventions and so forth. Never met the guy before in my life. His team fell for it. They brought me in. They brought me into Brian's office. Brian realizes I tricked his whole staff, and he said, you got five minutes, shoot. Now, I was talking to the decision maker, and within those five minutes, I was honest with him. He was the one I was trying to get to. I was honest with him. I told him who I was, where I was from, and exactly what I was trying to accomplish. And he just simply said, thank you for coming. Drove all the way back home to Miami, plenty of deodorant. Got a phone call a few weeks later. To my surprise, it was Brian. He did some research on me. He said, no, you know, normally we don't sponsor engines for something this dangerous because it's a single engine aircraft. But if you had the guts to find me, I believe you'll find yourself around the world. Sponsored an engine worth $83,000 right there on the spot. After that, I was able to get other parts donated. I cut the cost of the plane from $650,000 to $350,000, financed the rest of it with the help of someone interested in being a partner on the airplane. And that's how I out-hustled the aviation industry in order to afford a $650,000 airplane. Getting the airplane was one thing. I had a few issues. Number one, the aircraft had no de-icing at that time. It wasn't certified by the FAA. In addition to that, the weather radar um, did not work outside of the United States. Now, when you have icing on the wings of an airplane, it's very dangerous uh, because you degrade the airflow over the wings and your airspeed just comes down, it gets lower and lower, and then you fall out of the sky, all right? It's something, it's something that you really have to pay attention to. This is what it looked like to uh, sit, sit down inside of my aircraft with all the digital gauges. This was before we had tablets back in 07, and uh, I had a huge 17-inch laptop I was working on, and I would sit like this for 12 and a half hours at a time by myself with no one to speak with. Uh, this was me preparing to cross the North Atlantic. Uh, this suit costs about $15,000. All right, what the suit does is if I had to make an emergency landing in freezing water, it'd give me five to seven minutes to get out of the plane, get out of the freezing water, and get myself into a life raft because what happens to your fingers after about five minutes in freezing water? They become numb, they become useless, so how will you open your life raft? I flew into this island here called Shemi, Alaska. You can see the runway is almost as long as the entire island. I almost killed myself getting in here. Uh, I had to deal with a lot of icing, so we went from a nice, beautiful day. But when you're flying for 10, 12 hours in certain regions of the world, weather can change rapidly, right? So it's not just about being a hot shot pilot and flying into different places. I also had to be a meteorologist as well. And we also had a temperature inversion to deal with. Normally, it's warmer the lower you are uh, to sea level. Well, that wasn't the case where I was flying to in Shemi, Alaska, and I landed with 12 minutes of fuel. After dodging so much icing, I landed with 12 minutes of fuel left in my airplane. 
and uh, very fortunate to be alive. Egypt was an eye-opening experience for me. Uh, it really got me thinking to see certain signs and symbols on artifacts in Egypt that you'd also find in certain parts of Asia, that you'd also find in certain parts of Central and South America. How did that actually happen? This was before boats were going back and forth and so forth. So that really got me thinking about, well, how can I have young people think about math and science in the same way? And the flight took me 97 days, 145 flight hours. I made 27 stops in 13 different countries. I uh, set the Guinness World Record for the age of 23, also the first black man to do it. And it, it, it was an inspiring experience. It, number one, to just survive the flight, I was very grateful for, but over 300,000 students followed my flight. So I realized I had the attention of young people, didn't know exactly what I wanted to do after I flew around the world. Celebrities wanted me to fly for them. Airlines wanted me to fly for them. And then I made it such an unpopular decision, and I said that I want to get involved in education. Right? I want to help young people do amazing things using math and science. So one of the first projects we did, I challenged 60 kids from failing schools in Miami to build this airplane from scratch. Not only build it from scratch, but they built it in a record 10 weeks. And after they built it, I was uh, brave enough to get in the plane and fly it on its first flight. And it was a huge success. Uh, the young lady on the left-hand side, her name is Bakari. When she started off with me, she couldn't even point out a 16th of an inch on a ruler. Now she's on a full scholarship as a math major at Duke University. Right? In addition to that, the young man on the right, Aaron, he was also involved in this project. I'll never forget him because it took him two hours to figure out how to turn on a vacuum. It was the funniest thing ever. <laughs> and now this kid is working uh, with the Army to disarm specialty bombs. All right? The same kid who took two hours to turn on a vacuum. So I said, well, maybe, maybe I'm just lucky. Maybe, you know, I don't really know what I'm doing. So we did another challenge. I challenged kids this time as young as eight years old to build a car faster than a Ferrari 430 Spider. This was the car that they built. They built a Factory 5 GTM. What I challenged them to do was to fuse together a 525 horsepower LS3 engine with a Porsche transmission that was flipped upside down, a pressure plate in between, put them together. They literally had to build the entire car from scratch, do the interior, and so forth. We then took the car and raced it against a jet on an airport. We raced it against a Learjet. Right? Young people can do anything. But how can I take this on a national scale? How can I expose you guys to some very innovative things that's happening out there? So our next big project is we're going to transform this $5 million private jet into a real life magic school bus. So we're creating a flying classroom, and we're going to go to some of the coolest places in the world and explore math and science and show practically how it works and why do we even care about it. Believe it or not, my starting and ending point is here in Washington, DC. Some of the places and people we'll work with is, for example, this beautiful creature. All right? This is known as the cane toad. Cane toad was originally brought over from South America to Darwin, Australia. And our mission, so you all will watch this virtually, vote on certain things that we're doing, and we also have a curriculum for teachers that they will go through. And you all will help me balance an ecosystem. Why? The cane toad was brought over from South America to Darwin, Australia. Scientists knew it was highly poisonous. This thing will kill anything from an alligator to a human being. Our mission is to go out, capture them, freeze them, and convert them into fertilizer. Now, what makes these creatures so dangerous? Why is there an imbalance in the ecosystem? Well, scientists brought them over to kill a beetle, but they did not realize this creature lays 12 million eggs at a time and has overtaken Darwin, Australia. All right, so this is one of our missions. Here's another one. Very cool guy, good friend of mine. His name is Eduardo. He's known as the bionic chef. You probably noticed something interesting about his hand, right? All right, let me tell you what happened to him. He was out hunting for food one day, was accidentally electrocuted by a down power line, took 2,400 volts through his body. 
had nine different exit points. So it, the, 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 the electricity flowed through nine different points of his body. He had a hole here in his head, another one here, another one here, another one here. Lost an arm, lost four ribs. And um, what kept him alive is the electricity was so hot, it literally fused together back his skin after it exited. So he did not bleed to death. He walked three miles, was able to get help, and he survived. But what makes him special is that we're gonna focus on biomedical engineering. And um, he has a limb that communicates with his brain, whatever he thinks his hand will do. And now he's able to be a chef. So we're gonna do an expedition with him as well. Uh, we have a number of different expeditions that we're doing. We're also working with uh, Nike. Uh, we're doing an expedition with them in their, in their headquarters, as well as Madden Sports. They're gonna put me inside a video game and show you guys about that. Long story short, anything is possible in STEM. It, it, it truly is. I started off as a high school football star who had no interest in pursuing these type of careers. Here I am today, enjoying what I'm doing. I make good money at what I do. I enjoy my life. I have a family now. And this, it, it's so interesting. I, I live in Miami still. I'm not too far from where I grew up. I'm on, I'm, I'm, I live in a better side of town now. But anything is possible. Anything is possible in these fields and you all can do it. So thank you all so much for having me here. Thank you.